Why don't we start with that, that last page? It's, it's a leaf from the Exeter book of Old English poetry. It's a, the Exeter book is an anthology. It's a collection of poems, and some of the most famous Old English poems are in it, such as The Wanderer and The Seafarer, which are often uh, read by uh, in survey classes and uh, English lit classes, so on. But the first item in the Exeter book is a collection of lyrics. They're called lyrics, but they are really elaborations on the O antiphons. Uh, so if you go to the, to, to the first page, uh, and, uh, this handout is not in the best possible order, but on the, the bottom of the first page, you will see an English translation of the Latin antiphons. They apparently date from the eighth century. We're really not sure where they come from, uh, but they are often sung. We will sing them today. The closing hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, hymn number 56. Uh, they're on the banners right out here in the inner narthex. And you can see them. They, they are each recited on uh, one of the seven days before uh, December 24th. Because, of course, Christmas begins at sundown on Christmas Eve. That's, it's, it's just like the Jewish Sabbath. It, it, the, the Christmas begins at sundown. Um, so the, the one I want to concentrate on today is the O antiphon for the evening of December 21st. We're just a little bit off schedule here. It is the fifth of seven, and it is the O Oriens, Splendor Lucis Alternae et Sol Justitiae, Veni et illumine sedentes in tenebris et umbra mortis. O rising sun, radiance of eternal light and sun of righteousness, come and illuminate those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Uh, so uh, as, you, as I put on the handout, an antiphon is simply an against sound, antiphon a short chant used as a refrain in a variety of liturgical practices. You'll find antiphons and all kinds of things, but usually in the, uh, they're associated with the recitation of the psalms. And so that, that's sort of the basic background. That's what these things are. They're, that you'll find them in all kinds of varieties. Um, let's go back to the, uh, the, the manuscript leaf, because if I don't look at it now, we, we won't get there on the, on the very last page. As I said, this is uh, one of the O antiphons. It's actually not the one we're going to look at today, but uh, I couldn't find a, an image of that leaf. Uh, you, can, you can read this. You really can. This is English. If uh, the scribe or if King Alfred came in here and we could make ourselves uh, understood uh, to him and by him, if we were to ask King Alfred, what language are you speaking? He would say... English, exactly how they would have said it. It would have been spelled a little differently. E-N-G-L-I-S-C, English. It's exactly what they're speaking. So if you can look at that, that first line, the first letters, Eala, Yosef, Mean. Eala, Yosef, Mean, Jacobes, Bern, Maig Davides. This is exactly what all the scripture readings are on today. Jesus is the son of David. And that link is, is crucially established through Joseph. We think Joseph is not important. He's very important because no Joseph, no genealogical link to David, King David. And that's exactly what this is saying. Eala, lo. Behold, Yosef mean, my Joseph, Jacobus Baron, son of Jacob, my Davides, kinsman of David. You can puzzle out most of the letters there, right? E A L A I O S. Don't be deceived by the long S. This is a letter that Thomas Jefferson would have used. Uh, it's since been abandoned, but that's an S. E. P-H, Yosef, 
mean. If you get all the minims together, it looks like it looks like it just slashes, or they're called minims, but it's M-I-N. Mean, mine. We still have it in mine. Jacobes, I-A-C-O-B-E-S. There's that long S again. Bairn, B-E-A-R-N. The R, it, it takes a little getting used to. You see how it descends, Bairn. If you go to Scotland this afternoon and, and you might hear some of them talk about their bairns, me bairns, it's their kids. Uh, children, my, uh, M, Ash, G. Uh, it looks like M, A, E, and then a funny looking letter called a yok, but that's a G sound, my. Uh, and the A, E is not actually A, E. It's a separate letter called an ash. Because there's a sound in Old English, ah which we still have in English, in, for example, cat, ah. But that sound does not exist in, in Latin. You can take all the Latin classes you want, and you will never say, ah. <laughs> so the old English scribes had a problem. They're using the Roman alphabet to reproduce the sounds of their languages. But there are sounds in Old English that aren't in the Latin alphabet. So they invented letters. Ah, is one of them. And there's, there's some others. Oh, the, 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 the y, the G, the h <laughs> sound. Very dramatic. It's not in Latin. So they invented letters to represent it. All these letters and sounds, that were, uh, all these letters were abandoned in the 18th century because uh, all the dictionary makers and, and grammar uh, pedants did not want English to look barbaric. As we have to look like Rome. We have to look like our European colleagues. Uh, so th that's why we have ridiculous spellings such as <laughs> night, spelled K-N-I-G-H-T. And we're still wrapping our, our, our you know, fourth graders across the knuckles for misspelling it. Night, K-N-I-G-H-T, what's wrong with you? It's spelled that way, but it was, uh, in Old English it was pronounced Knicht. The spelling has remained the same. The pronunciation has changed. All right, so you can, you can have fun with uh, the, the, this, this old English leaf. Puzzle out some more of the letters. This is a poem. But you look at it and you say, well, it looks like prose because it's written from margin to margin. That's how they wrote. The, all the old English poetic manuscripts are written as prose from margin to margin. How do we know it's a poem? Well, let me show you. If you go to the internal pages, pages two and, and three, I've given you on, the, on the, the verso a translation of the O antiphon that I want to look at in Old English today. It is the O Orient, O Rising. O oh, day star, shining ray. So you can read that for yourself, I don't, uh, and we can refer to it. What I really want to do is spend time with the Old English lyric th that corresponds to the O Orient's antiphon. And here we are again. Ala Erendel. There's that word again, Ala. It's related to our modern English word, alas. But here it just means, oh, behold, uh, pay attention, poem is beginning. Eala Erandel, Engla Bert, I'm sorry. Eala Erandel, Engla Bertast, over Midanier Monum Sended, on Sofasta Sunan Lama, Torft over Tunglas, Vutida Yahuana of Silphum the Sumna in Litis. Well, that didn't make much sense. <laughs> but this is, if you pay attention, you can see how we know this is a poem. Old English poems alliterate. Uh, some of them rhyme. There is rhyme in Old English. Don't let anyone, anyone tell you differently. It's just not very common. But the predominant uh, poetic device is alliteration, which when you think about it, is nothing more than initial rhyme. Rhyme, we usually think of as uh, the, the duplication of terminal sounds. Well, alliteration is simply the duplication of initial sounds. So they do rhyme. It's, a, it's just rhyming in a different place. 
Let, look, at the, look at the fourth line, which is a classic example of an old English poetic line. Torft over Tunglas, du Tide, Johanna. The dominant alliterative sound there is t, 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 t. This is the classic old English line. It's in two half lines. And this is, this is just an editorial convenience. They're, it's not written that way. It's not spaced that way. But in the recitation, it seems to be governed by two half lines with a seishura, a pause in the middle. Torft over tunglas. Du tida Yahana. Each half line has two stresses. Torch over tonglas. And they alliterate. Same sound. Du tida Yahana. And the second half line has two stresses. The first stress of the second half line alliterates with the first two sounds. The ch ch ch. The fourth stress does not. It's stressed, it does not alliterate. And you see that, you can see this over uh, uh, and over again. Uh, you go down a little bit. Sunan, Soldan, Fader, Swegles in Wuldra. Wuldra. Look at the first line. It's a little, little confusing, actually. Ela, Erandel, Engla, Berotas. What is the alliterating sound? All vowels alliterate with all other vowels, which gives you some flexibility. So it's just alliterating on the vowel sound. And that's, you know, that's the, the mystery and wonder of vowels, is that they're very slippery. Consonants usually hold their, their shape, their form, and their pronunciation. Vowels, as anyone who tries to learn a, a foreign language realizes, or even if you pay attention to dialects of English, it's the vowels that are always changing. What did he say? It's the vowel. Uh, all right, so uh, that's all I want to say. Now we're going to try to translate as much of this as we can. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you, I, I will allow you to refer to the, the modern English translation, which, which will be a false friend on many occasions. But uh, that's okay. You can look at it if you want. Just let, let's look at the just the first ten lines or so. I just want you to tell me if you see any words that you recognize, and if you you can see there are many words here that are perfectly recognizable. They're just spelled a little differently. There's over, over. Yes, the the F is the V sound, just like German. Over. Uh, and se sended, sent. Uh, on is and. Uh, is is and in line three. Uh, yep, swap out the a, the o for the a. And. Uh, yeah, God is around. Yes, he is. God. God is uh, is an old English word. It's it's actually a Norse word. It has nothing to do with good. Uh, it's just a, a, a modern English coincidence, uh, but. Uh, the, old, the word for God and the word for good have separate roots, but it makes poetic sense. I feel like Arendelle is a place in the Lord's Oh, boy. Yeah, that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, I'm sorry, you thought of the place? Or Midenyar is, is uh, Middle Earth. Yeah, yeah. Midenyar is definitely a place. That's where we are right now. It is the middle yard, as in your backyard, a space. And it is the middle yard, the middle place or space, because heaven is above us, hell is below us. We are in the middle, middle mid and year, and, and Tolkien made a lot of hay out of that. So, you know, it's, a, it's an old English word, it's a middle English word. Um, uh, Arendelle, uh, I'm sorry, Mandy, what did you think it was? Well, I just feel like it's the opposite place of Tolkien. But... It, 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 yes, Tolkien, what, this is one of the words... That, that, that enchanted Tolkien and, and led him down the path of becoming an old English scholar. You know, uh, Tolkien, you know, he fought in World War I. He was wounded, uh, uh, obviously, as, uh, as a young man. His first job was working for the Old English Dictionary. 
I'm sorry, the Oxford English Dictionary, that's a silly mistake, the Oxford English Dictionary in, in Oxford, and that's where he started learning a lot of Germanic languages and linguistics and etymology. This word, Arundel, enchanted him. Tolkien wrote his own poem on this subject. You can look it up. Um, I, I, I won't, well, I will be unkind about Tolkien. I see no reason to make up the mythology he made up because the mythology that already exists is even more fascinating and, and worthy than the fake mythology, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Arundel, what, what word is Arundel corresponding to in the Latin? What, what is the Old English poet translating or naming? The first line. Oh, Add a second word. I don't know, because Angla Borca sounds like angel brightest. Yes, brightest of angels. But the Arendelle is a shield? I don't know. Well, well Arendelle, brightest of angels. Arendelle is an angel. Oh. A divine messenger, a divine spirit. It is a name, and we don't know where this name comes from. It appears one other time in Old English poetry. It's, it's not exactly what's called a hapax legomenon, but it's close. A hapax legomenon is a, is a word that appears only once in a corpus of anything. And this raises obvious difficulties for translators, because all you have to go by is context. What might it mean? Arundel is the name of an angel. And we can't, even the elements, you can try to break it down. I don't think it's the Dale word, you know, D-A-L-E. Arundel has something to do with, with, the, with the rising sun, with light, Arundel, an angel of light, which makes sense. Al Arundel, brightest of angels. And then the, in Tolkien, Tolkien makes him an elf who becomes then the, the morning. Star. Yes, it's, yes, it's the morning, the morning star, the name of the morning star. Which I, I you know, won't, won't object to that, but we really don't know uh, where this word comes from. Where this name—it's a name of, of an angel. Over midden yard, over the middle yard, monum sended. Monum. What word do you see there? You've got, to, you've got to change the vowels. You see, this is the trick. Men, men plural, to men. Monum, if we have the... Here, I'm going to give you a little bit of grammar. When you see the U-M, I know that this is usually a dative plural ending. It's the standard dative plural ending in Old English. With dative, you always translate a dative with with, from, to, or by. So monum, with, by, to, or from men. Two men. Behold, or lo, angel, bright, oh, behold, Arundel, brightest of angels, over the middle yard, sent to men. It's perfect sense. Send it is just a past participle. Send it. And we've made, it here it's, it's using the, the dental suffix ed. Well, we, we use the dental suffix t. Sent, sended. It's so, the monum did say sended. Well, exactly. It's just, yes, children speaking, uh, you know, learning how to speak English, you know, instead of, of you know, wrapping them over the knuckles with the, with the ruler, we should commend them for speaking historical English. <laughs> this is exactly how English at various times was pronounced. No, no, two men. It it's means two. Two men. two men. Over the middle yard sent to men, or to men sent. Oh, I thought you meant two, like the number two. Oh, no, 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 T-O, preposition. Okay, two men. With, from, to, or by is Got always it. for, okay, for yeah, a dative. Right. Oh, a little more um, and so line, <laughs> line three, I'll do the first word, and do you see any other words there that, oh, I... I think I know that word. Sun. Sun. S U N is there. Sothbasta. 
Reminds me of soothsayer. Yeah, sooth. Sooth is an old word for truth. A soothsayer. For sooth. Sooth, truth, fast. Truth, fast. It's simply a compound word. And the truth, fast. You see the N at the, uh, sorry, you see the A at the end of soul, fast, uh, That tells you that it's an adjective and it's modifying another noun that ends in A. Leoma. Leona means light, and you may not. Uh, but, but, but you know what you see in Leona? Lumen. How many lumens in that, in that light bulb? I don't know. Lumen, Leona, light. And the, and the true, fast light of the sun. Because this is Orient. This is light. Torched over Tunglas. Now, you, you, you're not going to get these, because these are all Old English words. How did our translator do it? More brilliant than the stars. All right. Tungl, tungla is an Old English word for stars. It's gone. Uh, everyone say a prayer, the word has died. <laughs> this word no longer exists in, in modern English. We should bring it back. Torft means bright. And it's cognate with, anyone know what a torque is? T-O-R-Q-U-E. Yeah. What's a torque? Look, it's like in your car. You have a certain car. Oh, oh gosh, where does that come from? I don't know. Yes. Well, no, I'm saying. It's a horse, right? It's a horse, yes. A horse? Horse. 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 Oh, a horse, no. No, it, it's it's a it's a neck ring, a bracelet, a torque. Yeah, oh. different uh, and then yeah. different roots, I think. So T O R C is usually how that's. Yes, I'm so, yes yes T O R C is the neck bracelet. I'm sorry, T O R Q U E is like horsepower and <laughs> yeah, yeah. That they've got to be different roots. I'd have to look that up. I never okay. never thought of that. Um, in, 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 uh, in October, uh, Lynn and I, my wife, we went to Dublin. We went to the National Museum, which I'd never been to before, where they had the bog bodies and all this. It's pretty cool. Isn't it? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I, know they had, I knew they had good stuff. I didn't know they had that much good stuff. And it's loaded with torques. So they have just case after case after case of these bright, shiny, Neck necklaces, neck rings, bracelets. Why are they called torques? Because they're torqued. They're bright. Is it related to torch? Oh, what? Yeah, I. Oh, that's a good one. I'd have to look it up. Tork, tork. You know, it probably is. You see, how in all, in in all of our study and use of language, we've just been playing an elaborate game of whisper down the valley. <laughs> You know, I, I could you know, whisper something to Rowan and could all whisper it to each other and it'd come over to John. And you know what would happen. It would be different. Yeah, John would say, the, what? <laughs> Telephone or whisper down the valley. Yeah. How did it? Because it's always changing. Yeah. Pronunciation. So bright over the stars, zu. Zu. Now, if we were using the, the 1928 prayer book, you would know perfectly well what I'm talking about. Thu. Thou. thou. The, thy, thou. So that said, looks like P-U is thu, is L. Uh, that, no, that, that is a, another Old English letter. It's called a thorn. T-H-O-R-N. Uh, and uh, here, I'm looking at this copy. Do we have any Eds? I'm trying to... Yes, we do. I'm sorry. Uh, where uh, I sh I'm sorry, I should have I should have given you line numbers. It's like the tenth, it's around the tenth line. Yeah, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The, the twelfth line, fat thu. Here, let, you see where I am? Yeah. Yes. Fat thu. Now I have to be careful about this. This is the difference between voice and unvoiced sounds is unvoiced, meaning the, vibe, the vocal cords do not vibrate. 
is voiced. Now, how do we represent this sound today in modern English? TH. What a cop out. What a joke. <laughs> TH. Tell me how you're supposed to pronounce TH. T H. T H. It is a thank you 18th century. This is the gift of the Enlightenment. <laughs> they didn't want the language to look barbaric. The old English scribes knew perfectly well that these were two different sounds. S is not v. So they invented two letters to represent those sounds, a thorn and an ed, also called a broken d. And you can see both of them there. That's v. I'm not always careful about differentiating because it's hard. Fat Lou. Uh, you, see, you see how. What's, no, no, it's. No, it's, it's a voiced th, as in that. Or this. Not, not in those sounds. It's just. And <laughs> what we think is an L or a B is not. In love. No. It's not. Yeah, there's no. Uh, um, all right, let's here, let's go let's go back to. Uh, if I start the to or Then what's the what's the word after that? Thou. Su. Thou. You. You, it's addressing, see, this whole thing is an address to Arendelle. Oh, Arendelle, brightest of angels, sent over the middle earth to men, and the true fast light of the sun, bright over the stars, you! You see how it picks up the address? It's, it's all vocative. You, Yahuanatida. You, each of times. Yahuana is a, is a, indefinite pronoun, each, Yahuana, Tida is, is an only word for time. Uh, I bring you tidings of great joy, or the tides, the tides uh, on, on the coast. Why are the tides the tides? Because they are timed. If we lived on the coast, we would know when high and low tide are. What time? Yahuana is what? Each, each of times. You, each of times, of silphum, of yourself, se sumla in litis. Of yourself to you always light. That's a strange line. How did that translator do it? You light up every season of your own self. I don't know where he's getting season. Um, that's not going to, there's no season in that line. Of yourself to you always of light. In licht is, is, is just means of light. Licht is, is light. We are right around that, that line. Um, that, that's a tough line to translate. Swatu god of god, yero achenet. God of good. God of good. Good is, is, is also an Old English word. It's just, it, they come from different roots. God of good. God of the good. So the, you, God of, of good, yearo achenet. Achenet is a past participle and it just means brought forth. Yearo is an adverb meaning readily. So you, God of good, readily brought forth. So the, the, there's the imagery of birth coming, of, of, of birth, of rising. Sunu Sodan Father. And you get those words? Father is, is a dead giveaway. Father. There's that, there's that ash. Fa. Father. That's how it would have been pronounced. That's why they spelled it that way. Fa. Ah. Father. We've already had Sodan. No, no, Soth. Soth, that was, that was the Soth Fasta in line three. Now we have Sodan, now it's just truth. And then we do have Sun. Sunu is Sun 
of the true Father. Who is the son of the true Father? Uh oh. <laughs> right. What are all these O antiphons referring to is, of course, the advent of Christ. You, the God of good, readily brought forth, son of the true father, swegnes in wuldra butan angina aivra waira. Swegl, it mean, it's a noun, means... Yeah, no, swegla means glory or, uh, yeah, glory. In wuldra, mean, uh, wuldra is an old word for sky. So in, of the glory in the sky without beginning ever were. Christ, yes, he was born on Christmas Day, but he was already pre-existing. He was always existing, ever, ever He's the son of the true father in, uh, gl of glory in the sky without beginning ever were. You ever were. Swa thek nu for therefum din agen ye were bideth through bildo. Oh boy, now the syntax gets a little more complicated. Really? Uh, <laughs> the the, the very first part wasn't complicated? Uh, <laughs> The, the first thing you have to do when you, you, know, you, you come up against a clause like this, you say, oh my goodness. I mean, I, I hesitate too. I say, where do I go? What do I do? Where do you go? Would you look for the verb? When you're stuck, you say, okay, what is the verb? I, I, all right, so I'm taking guesses. Beat it. Beat it. There it is. There it is. What is, and we, we this is an old, uh, this is an old, it's an old word. We still use it in an archaic sense. <clears throat> we still say to bid your prayers. The bidding prayers. To bid. And even if you go to Las Vegas and if you bid, what are you doing? You're gonna afraid bid. you're going to win. No, what you, literally, what are you doing? You are, you, no, 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 no. You're putting money down. You're bidding. You're offering. I'm bidding. A bidding prayer is an offered prayer. So to bid it is to offer. Okay. Sort of build up. I'm, sorry, I'm going to the end of this clause. Remember that old English is a dramatic language. Now I see it. I'm sorry I didn't give you line numbers. Bid it through build up. I go to the end of the clause because English is a dramatic language. Likes to put its verbs at the end of sentences end of clauses, and you listen to a German, and the verb is always at the end. And it's like, can't you just say it? <laughs> um, you know, Mark Twain has a wonderful line in Connecticut Yankee, but he's speaking to a German, and he says, this German swam the breadth of the Atlantic, and he came out at the other side with the verb in his mouth. <laughs> so, oh boy. Thek. And again, this is, he's addressing the Aaron Dust. So you, now, for need, for needs, Seraphim is an old word meaning needs. So you, for needs, thy own work offer through grace. Is anybody, can you parse out what, the, well, how does the translator do it? Uh, so now needfully your own creation abides you faithfully. Oh my gosh, right, that's fine. Yes, that's, I hate reading translations. They, they make me a little ill because you're not reading, it's just, okay, that's fine. You are not reading the poem. You are miles and miles away. But, but what is what is thy own creation? What's what's the poet talking about? Thy own creation. Christ? No, 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 no. He's talking to Christ. He's saying, Christ, it's you, because of need, thy own creation offered through grace. Who who is Christ's creation? 
Us. Us. You have come to us for our needs. So you now, for needs, uh, you, you uh, pray or offer through grace, through bildo, through grace, your own creation, your own work. You have now come to save us. It's all an address to Christ. What I really want you to get is that, remember from, from page one, the O antiphon for this uh, day, December 21st, is simply, O radiant dawn, splendor of eternal light, son of justice, come and shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death. That is the only frame or prompt that the poet has to work with. Look at what this old English poet came up with based on that prompt. He had four lines of Latin hymnody. And look at what he generated. It, it, I, I just, it's a remarkable poem. All right, we're here. Where are we? And we could do this. Uh, yeah, we, we can go another five minutes or so. Um, so the Arendelle is Christ. Yes. Oh, it's a metaphor for Christ. It's a name of Christ. Christ has many names. Because, again, look at the, look, look at the O antiphons on, the, on page one. What are the names of Christ? Wisdom, leader, root, key, dawn, king, Emmanuel. Those are all names. That's all this is. Names of Christ. Ways of referring to Christ. So Arendelle, that's, that really is a mystery. Uh, uh, it, it's what in, in Old English, or many other subjects, but uh, it's known as a crux. C-R-U-X. And a crux, in, in, in all kinds of disciplines, is a question that nobody can solve. It's a crux. It's like, oh, gosh, I don't, I don't know. And, you know. Scientists have this, and linguists have this. and every, you know, I, No one really understands what it, what it means. Arendelle is a crux. No one has a good explanation for this. Until someone busts the, tr the crux, B-U-S-T. I had a professor in grad school who was really one of the most skillful crux busters in, in Old English scholarship because he could figure these things out. And then he would publish, you know, it would be about a half a page in an explanation. He's, he always said that most of his publications could fit on his tie. <laughs> But they were elegant and precise, and everyone who read it would say, oh, wow. yep, of course. <laughs> he would bust the crux. No one has busted this crux yet. How do, we, how do you bust a crux? You find a piece of evidence that no one's looked at yet, or found. Or you look at two pieces of evidence, evidence a little differently. Say, oh, you know what? Uh, that's the kind of work I try to do, and sometimes I'm successful. You have to be really good at this. You have to be a little oh, lucky. Yeah, sure. I'd love to find out what they are and that means. No one knows. All right. Uh, we're not telling. <laughs> <laughs> um, here we, uh, here, why don't you just cast your eye over the whole passage? Uh, any other words that, you, that you, you won't be able to sleep tonight unless you know what, <laughs> what they're doing here? Rowan wants to know about... Like one, two, like nine-ish from the bottom. And she was like, that long... Oh, Alnichtigam. Yeah. Say on, you see where I am? Say on Frumthe was Father Alnichtigam. Say, we've sort of had this before. Again, it's addressed. You. On Frumse, this is a word, it's, again, it's not with us anymore. In the beginning. You, in the beginning, was Father Elmichtigum. What was Christ in the beginning? Father Almighty. We could, we're going to hear that right in a few minutes. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Ah, it's the same language, it's the same words. F and a, keep going. Even H mid God. Even equal with God. Well, there's a lot of theology right there. Christ is even equal with God. Okay, we'll figure that out later. 
and new after and now afterwards become flash fear in alas flash it's right there flash flesh what is christ flesh fear in alas fear in is a word it's gone it means sin less means less as in l e s s flesh fear in alas without sin less less of sin without sin uh that seo fanna ye bayer ye onum to ye ocha see where i am about eight or nine lines from the bottom that the seo fanna the woman what woman mary and, and that's the feminine word fanna feminine that's a greek word i think and it's just there's lots of greek and latin words in old english they're still with us that the woman ye bayer bore ye onum to ye ocha that's a great uh, half line it, it, and it alliterates beautifully yeomor in old english means miserable yeomor yeocha means help h e l p that the woman bore to the miserable ones to help who are the miserable ones we are <laughs> we are the miserable ones he has come sinless to help us this is a, it's a, you can see it's a uh it's a great poem god was mid us oh there it is god was mid us yeah you see you spend a little time with this oh, you can understand this uh uh yesuen buten sinum brought forth without sin all right and it, it goes on all right that's probably enough you 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 uh suffered uh but, uh, but, but uh, you know Nathan will appreciate this and and Mandy but uh you know a lot of my colleagues look at this and they say you call yourself an english english professor this is an english <laughs> and i'll say uh, excuse me this is more english than you possibly know this is where their language came from <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Well, a few more times I might be convinced. Oh no, it's 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 English. <laughs> so so maybe the trick is that we should find a new word for what we speak now or what we read now. I don't know, Jeff. I mean, it, this is it. It felt like translating a foreign language. Yeah. But it, it it is a kind of it is it requires translation. But something else I hope you notice is that, actually I didn't point this out but that line we just looked at seo fine that seo is the is a definite article and it is feminine singular feminine nominative singular seo old english had grammatical gender we don't have grammatical gender anymore other languages do yeah. they've kept it we don't old english has grammatical gender it has a fully inflected case system we talked a little bit about the um dative plural the a is usually genitive plural the e is usually dative singular I mean not always this is this is what's tricky they say oh I, this is my students say all the time you said a was genitive plural except when it's not one of these other things which is like, welcome to you know, yeah exactly exactly all right well, thanks everybody for for coming you can have you can have fun with this and, Um, yeah. Yeah.